the videos that we produced so far, we have looked at what universal basic income is, why some people think it's a good idea, a lot of the arguments used against it and how people respond to those arguments. But there's an elephant in the living room. And that elephant is how much should universal income be? So let's find out what the experts have to say about that. Um, I think some people like to say it should be a certain, to provide a certain minimum standard of living or something like that and draw the line there. I call that a subsistence basic income. And the problem with that is that you're going to end up in one of two scenarios. In one scenario, um, maybe you overestimated what the economy can do. Uh, and it actually can't provide a basic income that's that high. Uh, and now you're committing to provide benefit to people at that level uh, and you keep coming up short, uh, you know, and, and if you're committing to that real, real level of consumer purchasing power um, and you're not just setting it at a nominal level, then you're, you've essentially got a hyperinflationary spiral at that point. Uh, so that's one, uh, one possible outcome. The other possible outcome is that you're not uh, reaching the full potential of what could be achieved, right? If you're setting the basic income uh, at a lower amount than kind of the maximum sustainable level, then you, you could have done better and you just stopped. Uh, so that's why I advocate calibrating the basic income and really feeling for what the economy can handle. Well, I have to hold my hand up and say, I, I haven't yet been able to run a macroeconomic model. So whilst again, my colleagues have been running micro simulation models, um, I, I'm which I think are helpful, but don't resolve the whole problem. Because if you suddenly introduce income to people, they're going to go and spend that. And therefore, you change the consumption function in the economy at macroeconomic level. You change the investment function, the production function, the employment function, all the rest of it. So I'm trying to see how we can feed that through a macroeconomic model before I could um, answer that question. And uh, But um, I would see uh, a basic income in aggregate to be in proportion to the creation of output by automation. So if automation, as I said earlier, were creating 100% of the GDP, then basic income would be 100% of GDP. That's a very simplistic answer, of course. But if um, automation is responsible for 30% of the GDP, then 30% of the GDP should be basic income. Um, I, I do accept the challenge that I haven't put numbers in, in that reply to you. And whilst my colleagues are working on micro simulation, can come back with their 60 pound a week and cost 168 billion and so on. And I accept and respect that. Um, I want to get some more macroeconomic modeling work done. That depends on what is already in place. It depends on the society. It depends um, on affordability. I think they, they, these are transitional issues. It's in the UK, um, what people are seem to be converge around is a very low minimum of something like 55 uh, pounds a week, up, up to between 55 to 67 or around that sort of a level a week. And then we seem this is very punitive and it is punitive, it's very low and it probably is, it is too low. Uh, but the fact that we're even discussing whether people have a right to that amount a week is I think quite telling. Talk about Australia for a moment, like an economy like Australia is where we've already got a somewhat robust welfare system, insufficient, but robust. I would say, leave everything in place, change nothing, but then bring in a payment, let's say $10 a week, right? $10 a week to start with, then you, then 20, then 40, then 80, right? And you keep increasing it. And when you know when it's starting to get too high because you start to get um, inflationary pressure, right? That's the limit because, okay, the economy can't, can't handle all this new spending. And that's doubled down if people start to leave that leave their jobs because you lose productive capacity if someone says, okay, I don't need my second job anymore, right? I, I've got one job, I don't need to drive an Uber after work as well anymore because I've got this supplemental income. Or a family says, okay, only, we're, we've got three jobs between two income earners in this family. We only need two jobs between you know two income earners now. Um, and so you see this reduction in the availability of labor and prices go up a little bit. And then you sort of say, okay, we're, get, we're starting to get inflation, then then you've got options. You stop increasing the UBI or you raise interest rates, you raise taxes, you reduce spending in other areas of the economy, right? And then you you, you edge it up. And then it becomes this political balance of, of, of how much do we think we want to increase the UBI versus this other kind of spending that we do. It's incredibly, it, the way I like to put it, I've heard it before, UBI is a door, right? It's the door out of this mess we're in. And we don't know what's on the other side of the door, 
but we know we don't want to stay here. The model that I work with is $410 a week for a working age population. Um, and that's slightly below the poverty line. It's about $20, $30 below the poverty line. And then he has, it's uh, $550 a week for people older than 65 uh, and people with disability and $105 a week for people younger than 12 years old. The work we've done here in Scotland um, from the RSA, but from a number of other organisations, has all largely been at roughly the same level. I, I find when I, I do a lot of public talks on basic income, and I find when I'm talking to a, a new group, I never mention a level during the introductory. It always comes up in questions, but I never mention it because it's always too high or too low. Where, you know, this is something we need to explore. And at the end of the day, it's a question for wider society and, and political decisions. But what I think is really interesting to reflect on is, is two things. One, the levels we've talked about for, you know, for basic income in Scotland in our reports, uh, the, the top level was £4,800 per year for an adult. Okay, and that's that's quite a small level. You say that to people and they, they do not, it doesn't sound life changing. And it, you know, it very much meets the, the basic level. This is not, you know, the kind of level of money instantly you're going to retire off and, and not have to, to work with you. Uh, I think there's a couple of things with that. One is it does start to add up, you know, so when you do have a family, because, you know, we propose a lower level that children receive and then a, a, a higher level is a basic income pension, if you like, for a pension age. Um, it does start to add up for a family when you bring that money in uh, and, and obviously are able to make use of it. Uh, but also, even at those levels, the 4,800, uh, the economic modelling that we carried out within our report uh, indicated that that level of, of basic income would eliminate destitution entirely in Scotland uh, and reduce poverty overall by about half. Uh, but for me, I think even that basic basic income that we've talked about uh, does give a fundamental impact uh, on, on society, on the, the people who are suffering the most just now. Uh, and I think shows that you could even start at quite a low level and have the opportunity to grow and expand from there if you find that it was, it was having the impact that you wanted to see. Uh, anything's a good start. In Alaska, they have a UBI that's now, that reached a height of, of $3,200 a year per person, and it's now down to about $1,000 a year per person, which is better than nothing. And if you're a single mother with three kids, you get a $4,000 check once a year, that's going to make a difference. But it's certainly not enough. I, I think it needs at least uh, it needs to be at least enough to live on above poverty. And the way we measure poverty is very poor in the United States. In the, in the United States, I think it should be uh, it should be um, at least uh, at least 150 percent of poverty, maybe more. Uh, it needs to be enough that you can live in dignity, you can participate in your society, you can get food, shelter, clothing. Uh, 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 some basic transportation and a cushion for a cushion to for to pursue other projects that are that are important to you. If somebody wants you to work, they can reward you with greater luxuries. That's still not you know even a twenty thousand dollar UBI in the United States would be one hundred and sixty seven percent of poverty. Well, I'm using nineteen uh, 2020, 2015 statistics, but uh, it's not that far away. Uh, um, a hundred and that's still think about twenty thousand dollars a year. That's that you know uh, that's way below our per capita income. You've got a, employers have a lot of room to give you a good incentive to give you a job, give you a fifty, sixty, hundred thousand dollar a year job, and uh, most people are going to take that versus a twenty thousand dollar basic income. And if they don't, well, more power to them. They're they're living off the compensation that they've been owed by the fact that somebody else took all the resources and said they're mine. You can't have that. But that does create a problem. It creates a problem that you got two choices. You can set it at just enough for one person to be above poverty, which is going to be then really generous to two people living together. Or you can set it just enough for two people who are living together and uh, not be overly generous to them, but then have a bunch of single people be still living in poverty. So uh, I err on the side of generosity is that our economy has been so ungenerous to the middle and lower class for about 5,000 years. It's really time that we think about erring on the side of being overly generous. It's all very well talking about what level universal basic income should be at, but how do you fund it?
So yeah, the options for paying for UBI is just, just uh, there's, there's so many of them. There are lots of ideas on how you fund universal basic income, but you can broadly divide the ideas into two camps. One camp suggests that in order to fund universal basic income, we need to take the money from taxation, either from increasing taxes or changing the structure of taxation. Then we just need to realize that it's, it, it's time that some of those gains that have happened since the Reagan and Thatcher revolution need to be shared among everybody. Realize, wow, that's half of our GDP. Uh, that's gone to the top of 1%, half of our GDP. That can be shared among other people. You share half of that with everybody else, and they're still, the top 1% are still 25% better off than they were. There is a second camp who believe in the printing of money. By issuing money into the economy. Uh, so printing money, right? Um, now that might sound uh, more controversial than it actually is, because I would say that anytime the government spends, they're adding new money to a part of the economy that didn't have that money before. Uh, so now it sounds like I'm saying something very boring, um, but it lets you, when you frame it that way, it lets you ask the question, okay, how does other economic policy affect the amount of money that the government can issue into the economy? In most high income countries, the income tax system is riddled with um, tax expenditures, non refundable tax credits, and deductions that disproportionately um, benefit high income people. And so I think that an elimination of those um, deductions and non refundable tax credits would go a long way towards funding a basic income. I think it could replace the basic personal amount, basic personal allowance or exemption on the income tax. Um, but again, that depends on the structure of the tax system. So we would still have income tax. I don't, I don't subscribe to the idea that income tax is the only way that you would pay for a basic income. I think we have to look at a new way of, of revenue generation, we, you know, data, we look at land, we look at uh, environmental taxation. Uh, you know, a, a good friend of mine has one of his proposals for paying for basic income was that you know legalize marijuana and tax that because the, the hope with climate taxes is that you won't it'll be a decreasing revenue stream because you'll change behaviors whereas with marijuana you might see it as an everlasting uh, revenue stream and certainly many u.s states are, are starting to see that now the author uh, are proposing a 37 uh, flat tax rate on all incomes uh, and a two percent tax on wealth then they go on there is a big chunk of definition what is implied by wealth what would be included not included there was a big debate so would the first house be included would a primary mode of transportation be included in wealth and that is again that is open to democratic debate and decision making so systems that work very well in terms of guaranteeing income security and also um providing a re entries into uh paid work or other activities are the Nordic countries, which have historically co-funded basic income security through insurance mechanisms combined with the systems. Now, what does that mean? It means that people in work contribute to their own income security in, in periods of transition so that they will receive more money that corresponds to their previous wage and they receive some subsidy of the state, but the, actually the state commitment goes down because you have these co-finance mechanisms. So I think once you start putting uh, systems in place that have building blocks um, within them, like a universal basic income, which you retain when you work, there will be spare capacity from your earnings to contribute to these co-funding mechanisms. What you're trying to do when you fund UBI is make resources available. The net recipients are going to be able to, to buy the, the goods that are available. You got to discourage resource use or pushing up prices by the wealthy. Of a poverty line UBI in the United States, uh, I've calculated at 2.95% of GDP. That's for the smaller one of the poverty line. The higher one, the $20,000 one, that's 167% uh, uh, of the poverty line. That cost is gonna be closer to 10%. It's like 9.6 or something like that percent of GDP. The net cost of the net cost of a poverty line UBI in Britain is about 3.4% of GDP, including the, the netting out of other um, of other um, 
programs that UBI could replace. So in the, U, in the US one, I'm not netting out that. The one thing that both are netting out that's really important is to net out the fact that with UBI, most of what you're doing is paying yourself. It does not cost you any money to pay yourself. So people think, oh, the UBI cost, you know, you, you take the, the size of the UBI, multiply it by the cost of the number of people in the country, and that's the cost of UBI. That is not the cost of UBI, because most of those people are, their taxes go up and their UBI goes up, and those two things cancel each out. But what about printing money? How does that work? We have to get rid of the idea that taxes fund spending, because it's not true. This is a history of US budgets or surpluses as a percentage of GDP. And it's clear just from a media, and, and the blue the blue one is the GDP um, in billions, right? So it's clear that the average, the normal thing is to run a deficit, right? And this is, so politicians are always talking about balancing the budget, but they rarely do it. And as I like to say, it's good that they don't live up to their word. If they lived up to their word, they'd constantly be crashing the economy. So right now we've got the Liberal government in Australia has just announced a record sized budget. And they'd of course run on the idea of balancing the budget. And it's at least they're hypocrites because if they were, if they stuck to their promise, we'd all be screwed. This takes us to the ideas of an economist called John Maynard Keynes, writing primarily in the 1920s and 1930s during a troubled period for the global economy, Keynes advocated a system in which government spending was used to stimulate the economy. Modern economists don't like to talk about money very much. They like to say that it's a veil over barter. And this is one of the things that Keynes did that was sort of, you know, um, breakout was discuss money. Money has to flow through the economy for goods to flow as well. There is a subtlety to the views of Keynes. He believed that the economy is often held back because savings are too high relative to demand. This may well indeed have been a problem during the 1920s and 1930s in which he wrote, and maybe it is a problem today as well. What happens is that the financial sector always runs a surplus. The financial sector always takes in more money than it lends out. So the only way for that to be sustainable is for the government to always run deficits. So the money comes into the economy from the government and out of the economy from the financial sector. And that's like the positive and negative charge that turns the motor of our economy, right? Um, so the idea that you have to pay for it by matching, matching spending and taxes is just a myth. If Keynes is correct, then theoretically at least, it should be possible for governments to print money without creating inflation. Funding it by increased income tax has a, has a problem that you're then sucking demand out of the economy. And at the moment, demand in the economy um, is, is needed. It, it was the lack of funding of demand that caused the 2007 crisis. So um, proposals that you fund it by income tax, 3% here, taking away personal allowances there, and so on, have that problem associated with them, and most of them uh, try to go for a, a revenue neutral solution. Um, I don't think that tackles the problem of poverty, of austerity, and so on. If you then look at more radical options like wealth taxes, land taxes, eco taxes, each of them, in my view, have their limitations. Land tax is problematic because uh, we're not in an agricultural economy now, not even so much in an industrial economy. And when you look at the major earners in the, in the virtual economy, the FANG companies, the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Netflix, the Googles, and all the rest of it, I mean, they make huge earnings with very little land. So they'd end up paying extremely little of their corporate profit if it was all based upon land and the poor farmer down the road to be paying a huge amount. So uh, I, I'm not so uh, uh, impressed with a, a land tax proposal. On wealth tax, I think it'd be hugely problematic because wealth is held, you know, 12 trillion of wealth in the UK is held in so many different forms. It's held in houses, in PLC shares, in some people have got a yacht and it's held in money in the bank account. So it's a huge range of assets. Um, and I don't really see a practical way of taxing those. I mean, if you tax it by money, it actually becomes an income tax 
measured by what wealth you've got rather than actual wealth tax. But if people are expected to sell their house or to sell their PLC shares, or you know, if you approach the very rich uh, family like the Quants who own BMW, say, right, we get 10% of your factories. I mean, how is the state going to handle 10% of BMW's factories? Or uh, if Quant then have to sell them and so on. Now that's a big, big example, but you apply that throughout. I'm worried that it would create huge uh, administrative problems if the state were just going to say, that take um, one of your yachts or something, and that's if you've got 10 yachts. You know what I mean? But there's a huge problem uh, if you're going to liquidate, to liquefy um, those assets. And when you come to an eco tax, the problem there is eco taxes should be designed to get rid of pollution, not to raise revenue. So therefore, they should become self eliminating. Um, I, I, it seems to me very inconsistent to argue for a permanently reliable source of fund funding from from an eco tax. Eco taxes should be there to get rid of emissions, which we desperately need to happen. So therefore, I come through to debt-free sovereign money. A sovereign state can issue its currency. The 875 billion in the UK currently demonstrates that um, basic income should be funded by sovereign money because it is the only way to fund an adequate basic income and to escape the challenge that basic income is either too small to be meaningful or too large to be affordable. So yeah, debt-free sovereign money, in my view, is the sourcing fund. But generally speaking, I would, I, I like to think about, I like to start by thinking about holding all other fiscal policy fixed, holding all other taxing and spending fixed. What is the level of basic income that we can sustain right now? And I call that the, the natural level of basic income for the economy and that's what we want to calibrate to and assuming you're not changing any of that, that other stuff the only thing that can move is monetary policy so really as you are increasing the basic income what's happening is the central bank is is tightening monetary policy and reigning in the financial sector so that's kind of the low-hanging fruit right there uh, and then once you get to the point where you're at the maximum level you can sustain you can start asking questions like well what other fiscal policies can we change that maybe free up resources and allow um allow there to be more consumer spending in the economy because there's more things for people to buy that kind of stuff what i call my way of thinking about the economy about the monetary system is what i call cmt consumer monetary theory so it's just a framework for understanding how money can be used to provide benefit uh, to consumers. Next time, we will be looking at universal basic income and what impact it would have on the rest of the taxation system.